Um, my name is Christina Carell. I'm PAVE's education manager um, and helping coordinate and set this up. If at any time throughout the presentation you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A function. Um, we're hoping to leave time to get to that at the end for about 10 minutes. Um, I have my PAVE team here on the call, Charlie Moses and Mimi Public, who's going to be presenting. Um, he's our director of education. Um, and we're also joined by Nori de la Pena, who is with Public Health Seattle and King County and is a community outreach and cessation manager. And she's going to be talking for a bit about local resources um, they have to share. Um, so again, just thanks so much for taking the time to join. Um, and Mimi, I guess it's 3.02, so if you wanna get started. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to talk a little bit also, sorry about, just to give some context um, of why we're doing this. Obviously, youth vaping is as big of an issue as it's ever been. Um, as kids go back to school, you know, there's a lot more access to these products and nicotine addiction is alive and well. Um, but we also want to talk about sort of these colliding issues of youth nicotine addiction and mental health problems that we're seeing a lot of um, in youth right now. So um, in King County, which is similar to across the country, kids are experiencing uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, school closures, social isolation, family financial hardship, um, grief over illness and loss of family members. And so mental health issues, which, you know, this is within the context of already um, increasing mental health issues for the last decade plus um, have only been exacerbated and sometimes um, youth substance use can can interact with that in ways that worsen mental health issues um, and can have kids you know attempting to self-medicate so and these issues are um, you know tend to be elevated in communities that already have health inequities so black indigenous and other people of color um, and LGBTQ communities, which have um, way elevated rates of tobacco and vaping use um, compared to non-LGBTQ kids. Um, yep, yeah, so Mimi's going to touch on more of this as we talk about some of the reasons kids vape and the health harms related to vaping. Um, yeah, we just wanted to sort of frame that within this uh, timely context. Yeah, thanks, Christina. And I will share my screen with you all. Is that good? Is it on full screen? Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, first I wanna um, thank you for including us today. Um, we love to spread the word to as many people as possible. I know there are probably some educators here, some parents, some prevention people. So some of this may be familiar to some of you and some may be really new news. Um, I myself am a parent of three. I have a 24 year old, 21 and 18. And the reason I got into this myself, I'm fully volunteer. Um, I'm at, along with the three founders, um, all got into this because our kids were vaping and it happened before our eyes, uh, before we even knew what vaping was, they knew, and they knew well before. And um, then it was too late and our kids were addicted. And so, um, so we're all passionate about this. We wanna pass on the information. We hope it's useful to you. Um, I will just you know, introduce PAVE by saying that we are, many of us are volunteers. There are very few um, people actually work, <laughs> work for us, um, but we are powered by volunteers. We're powered by parents, by prevention people, by educators across the country. Um, and our information is science-based. So. Uh, we get the latest research from public health experts and partners throughout the country. Um, so that is important to know that our data, we're not making it up. I, I was not a scientist. Um, this is all sort of translational science for us. So we try and make it accessible to people so that they understand what's going on uh, with their own kids. And the other thing to mention is that we are, our goal is really to protect kids from the dangers of vaping, the dangers of e-cigarettes and the the predatory practices of big tobacco, we are not trying to tell adults what to do. So that is just a really important part of, um, of you know, what we do. It's really important to, to understand that we're not, we're not talking about adults. So um, I, um, 
just wanted to you know quickly talk about PAVE in this, how we got into this through the national um, epidemic and, and the marketing of big tobacco, a um, little bit about why kids vape and the health harms and very importantly, what parents and other adults can do. Um, so just very quickly, PAVE got started initially because uh, as I mentioned, uh, our founders and, and myself, our kids were all vaping. We didn't even know what it was, started finding these odd little devices in our kids' rooms and um, different signs, which we'll talk about in a little bit that I completely missed with my own child. Um, and what really pushed uh, the three founders over the edge is what is that um, a ninth in their son's ninth grade class, um, a, a jewel representative unbeknownst to the school, a jewel representative came into their school uh, under the guise of an anti-addiction talk and told the kids that Juul was totally safe, that it was about to be approved by the FDA, um, none of which was true. And the teachers were not in the room at the time. So um, they uh, didn't really know what was happening. But uh, this got our, our founders incensed and started PAVE. Uh, I joined them a few months later, again, because I was really upset, didn't know what to do with my own child. And um, so meanwhile, PAVE has really gone across the country to both educate uh, doing what I'm doing and, and hoping to sort of get other volunteers to do this across the country um, and, uh, and then also advocate, advocate for changes in the laws. Most importantly, we really wanna get flavored e-cigarettes off the market because the flavors are really hooking our kids and we can talk a little bit about, about what that means. Um, and you, you know, if you go to any vape shop or any bodega, any convenience store, you see these incredibly, uh, enticing flavors. Um, and so we currently have, we, we do have an epidemic on our hands. Um, the good news, there is some good news um, in that uh, we'll talk a little bit about earlier days, but from 2017 to 2019, there was a huge surge and we had over 5.3 million kids vaping in the US. Um, that was uh, thousands of kids a day initiating into vaping. Um, the numbers have come down uh, and just so you know, numbers tend to lag a little bit because uh, they're done in the prior year, but um, we went from 5.3 million kids vaping to 3.6 million kids vaping. So that is still epidemic proportions. We still have over 20 to 25% of high schoolers vaping. Um, so the good news is it did come down a bit um, and hopefully it's because of all this work and some changes in the laws that that are happening across the country. Um, the bad news is that for um, the kids who are vaping, we're finding that they're vaping more often, um, meaning there's probably likely a, a higher level of addiction with kids who are vaping. Now the COVID-19 pandemic stay at home orders and you know things like that it probably really did and isolation, kids isolation um, did affect both their patterns of vaping and their use. So, you know, kids who were probably stuck at home with their parents were probably vaping less, but kids who were really addicted, they were gonna find any way to vape. So um, now in 2021, we have a bit of a unicorn year because this data was collected in a very different way than uh, data has typically been collected because uh, we didn't have access. Kids were at home, they were being surveyed at home. So it was very different. So. The numbers here, which is 2.2 million, million teens, sounds like we've done an incredible job to go from 3.9 to 2.2 in a year, but likely this was a, a really a point in time and this number is not to be used as uh, to reflect any kind of trend. So I just wanted to really stress that um, these numbers are really kind of a, a point in time. But let's just look at Seattle for a minute. Um, so I, I think Seattle, you know, it looks like uh, it's a crisis. Unfortunately, we've seen these numbers before in other parts of the of the country. Um, what you have currently is uh, is over well over twenty percent of high schoolers vaping, and nearly forty percent have ever vaped have tried it. Um, what's interesting is if you look at those who smoke, um, it's about five percent. And so, you know, when people ask me, and one of the questions that came in is you know, um, is, is who's doing this. I mean, these were not risk takers. These are not kids who were on the fringe. Um, kids who are vaping now are very mainstream. This has become a very mainstream um, phenomenon, unfortunately. And uh, I will just show you here, if you look at this graph, 
um, you see the blue line represents uh, smoking among high, among tenth graders. So this is um, you know just looking at uh, looking at one grade, but it's it's uh, indicative. Smoking rates have come down, and if you look even beyond this into the 90s and early 2000s, um, smoking rates came down from about 19 percent down to single digits. And just like you all in Seattle, um, you know, about 5% under 5% have been smoking. But so we did so much, I think public health advocates, um, you know, great education across uh, decades have really brought smoking rates down. And then when Juul uh, had a heavy marketing push in 2017, look what happened. That's the red line. You see um, vaping rates just skyrocketed. So we had 135% increase among high schoolers uh, in two years alone and 200% increase in middle schoolers in just two years alone. So, you know, again, these are not kids that would have ever smoked necessarily. And unfortunately, we know that kids who vape are times more likely, and we've heard different things, but up to five times more likely to then pick up cigarettes. Um, and we've heard that from people uh, whose kids have been vaping and from, from people who've been vaping that, you know, when they need their nicotine, they're going to use whatever they can find. And sometimes that's a cigarette and then they become, you know, initiated into cigarette smoking. So just in terms of how this all got started, a really quick history, uh, because I think it's just really important to say that um, our kids would not have, most likely, would not have vaped if they weren't targeted. And you look at some of these ads and you can see um, these kids look like our own kids. They look like my daughter. That could be my daughter in there. Um, you know, what's, what's crazy is um, if you look at this one uh, marketing by Puff Bar, it talks about, you know, escaping, escaping parental texts, right? Um, these are people who are targeting our kids. These are not adults. Um, the industry will tell you that, you know, they were trying to help adult smokers quit. But these really tell a very different story. They're using influencers that our kids know. Um, they're targeting them with, with photos and very enticing ads um, that, you know, created the youth vaping epidemic. Juul started it, but they're certainly not the only ones. Um, now Puff Bar, many others um, are, are doing a really good job at targeting our kids. Um, you know, and you look at some of these old ads versus new ads, and you'll see again, it's the same story. It's just big tobacco using the same playbook with just a slightly different product, unfortunately. Um, you know, that Marlboro man looks very much like the blue man, and there's no, um, there's no coincidence there. And in fact, many of these companies, these vaping companies are owned by um, big tobacco companies, right? So um, they're just using what they already know. And unfortunately, um, you know, and I don't, I don't know, some of you probably, I live in a big city, I live in New York, um, and these, uh, these point of sale sort of enticing advertise, advertisements and products, they are in our kids' faces every day. Um, you know, in a given day walking to and from school, I'm sure there are hundreds of, you know, exposures visually uh, with my kids and probably with yours as well smoke shops, vape shops, it's really all right there for our kids to see. And it's very accessible and very often these, these um, retailers will sell to our kids, unfortunately. Um, and then you have uh, Big Tobacco's, you know, marketing uh, to, to, unfortunately, to populations. Um, and as, as uh, Christina mentioned, you know, these are populations that have been historically targeted by big tobacco and quite successfully, unfortunately. Um, they have a long history and a shameful history, frankly, of aggressive marketing to specific populations. Um, they use free products, they use giveaways, uh, they promote these as healthier. Um, when we testified in Congress, which we did against Juul because of that uh, issue with the ninth grade class, uh, we were able to hold the first congressional hearing against Juul, which was tremendous. And a woman from the reservations came to speak who was representing uh, the, 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 re the reservations, people on the reservations. And she said that uh, the jewel was coming to the chiefs of the reservations and offering free jewels uh, to try and get them enticed into, into vaping, into to, you know, vaping, switching from cigarettes. So, um, you know, this has been going on for decades, unfortunately. And this is just one more example of how big tobacco is targeting 
uh, populations, um, including, uh, and most shamefully, the, the, the Black communities for decades. Um, uh, the Black communities have been targeted by big tobacco, in particular with menthol cigarettes. Um, there was a huge push to get more Blacks to smoke. Uh, and uh, within just a few years of handing out free cigarettes in communities, uh, literally walking, if you, if you go on this incredible documentary, it's very short, um, but very interesting, called Black Lives, Black Lungs, um, you can see how tobacco companies were really targeting African-American populations. And now 85% of African-Americans who smoke use menthol. And that was, uh, that was very deliberate. Um, and now it's become a real social justice issue because, um, because the cigarette industry will say, well, Blacks need menthol, they, they need it. Well, you know, many advocates will say, absolutely, they don't need it. They need you to stop selling it to our population so that we can live healthier lives. So um, it's just another example of, you know, the tobacco industry's targeting. And in case you had heard of a flavor ban, um, there was a very small flavor ban a while back, but basically, it, it left all the same flavors on the market. So I just wanted to be aware in case to acknowledge that there was a flavor ban in the news. Um, it, it, it's, it, there were 15,000 flavors before the ban and there are 15,000 flavors after the ban. So I think that's just really important to know. Um, it really unfortunately didn't do much. So when we used to do these in person, um, I used to have bags of these products and hand them out to parents because I think it's really eye-opening to see what they look like. And very often I would hear parents go, oh, you know, I, I've definitely seen this in my kid's room or my kid's backpack, or I thought this was a flash drive. Um, so these are really favorites of teens right now. Um, disposables are really popular among teens. And we just wanted to show you these pictures because, um, because so you know what they look like, first of all, um, and to know that these contain really high levels of nicotine. Um, one of these, uh, one Stig or one Puff Bar, one of these devices, which is about 200 puffs, contains around one to two packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine. So they are loaded with nicotine. They're loaded with a special kind of nicotine that hits the brain quickly. Um, these are, so these are disposables. These are just thrown away. They're very cheap. They come in lots of different flavors. Um, why kids like these, in addition to being cheap, is that they don't have to keep them and hide them from you. They can smoke them, uh, vape them, and then throw them away, usually uh, not where they belong, which I'll get to very quickly later, but um, there's really not a great way to dispose of these because they all have uh, batteries in them and environmentally it's been become a real disaster. But the, there also are these pod-based devices, which is Juul. Juul is the one who kind of led the way um, on the left-hand side. And so if you see these little, little colorful things in your children's rooms, they might be empty pods. Um, these get put in, they have refillable, they have, um, they're not refillable, they have liquid in the pod and they put them in a device that does not get thrown away. Uh, only the pod when it's empty gets thrown away. And those have, were very popular, they're still very popular, but uh, the disposables have become even more popular. There was about a thousand percent increase in disposable devices um, in, in about in a year alone, um, in part due to that uh, partial ban I was talking about. Other teen fillable devices, um, basically these are devices that are used over and over and you buy e-liquid separately and then pour the e-liquid into the device. And the reason they love these is because they come in 15,000 flavors. Um, there are all sorts of flavors uh, and they're all kid-friendly flavors, Hawaiian punch, Kool-Aid, banana split. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, it's very easy for kids to get a hold of these. Um, they also sometimes use THC oils in these devices as well. Um, another product I want to make you aware of if you're not already, um, because these are also teen favorites, um, they're being used quite a bit by our teens now, is um, non-vaping nicotine products. So um, there are gums, there are um, pouches, the gums like Lucy gum, if you look at their advertising on Instagram and social media, you'll see they are really targeted to our kids. These are flavored gums that have nicotine in them. Um, Zin and Velo, these are pouches. So they're little pouches filled with a lot of nicotine. You put, put it in your, in, in your um, mouth and let the nicotine dissolve. 
um, very often our kids, including my own, um, when she was really having trouble getting through a day uh, without nicotine and didn't want to get caught at school vaping, kids will tend to can use these, you know, tend to use these devices uh, so that they get their nicotine hit by keeping the, you know, Zen or Velo pouch in their mouth or the gum that they chew. No one's going to know that it's nicotine. Um, that way they can keep their nicotine high if they're really, you know, dependent um, without having to vape and get caught vaping at school. So these products are very popular. There's even nicotine toothpicks, which sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, and uh, so I wanted just to show you that as well, in case you see those in your kids' backpacks. Uh, another product which we're really upset about is, um, is are these non-nicotine vapes. So these are vapes, just like they look like nicotine vapes, but they, they don't contain nicotine, but they contain a lot of chemicals. Um, and what's worse is that they're really advertised as these sort of wellness products that are supposed to help you, you know, sleep better and get vitamins and boost your immunity. Um, but the reality is that um, these have, the, they're making claims that have not been proven yet and nobody's stopping them. So they can really say whatever they want right now. Um, but we know even, we believe that even the companies don't think they're safe because early, um, early instructions on the labeling were things like suck into the mouth, do not inhale into the lungs and blow out. <laughs> now, first of all, if you're gonna not inhale it to the lungs, how are you supposed to get all these, you know, supposed wonderful benefits of these products? Well, you know, so obviously there are issues with these products that even they might acknowledge, but um, nobody's regulating these products. It's the wild west, so they can say what they want, they can sell them and make claims that, you know, I, I shouldn't say no one's regulating, but they're, they're currently uh, not, not really regulated as, as they're not regulated as tobacco products. And there's very little regulation. I think there are some people trying to change the laws around them, but currently, uh, there are claims being made that are not true. And unfortunately they're available at places like urban outfitter, which I know my, my daughter loves, and, you know, you can just walk in there and buy these, um, and think that it's okay. What I also don't love about them is, you know, first of all, they contain a lot of the same chemicals as e-cigarettes, which are not good for uh, developing lungs. Um, they can cause irritation of the lungs, but also because um, they're sort of like a gateway to the nicotine devices, right? If I can start to vape this, it's sort of the industry's way of getting you used to that. And then nicotine, putting nicotine in is just one step more. So, you know, we're all really concerned about these public health experts are also concerned about them. Um, you know, the flavoring, the, the, even without anything else in them, the propylene glycol and glycerin, which are what are used to convert the liquid to a vapor um, are shown to cause inflammation in the lungs. So these are not good products. I just want you to be aware. And in fact, my daughter, again, I'm using my daughter a lot, but when she was trying to quit vaping, she said, well, I'm using uh, these other products, uh, the Ripple, which is one of the products, so that, you know, I, it's kind of breaking her habit of using nicotine, but what she didn't know is that, you know, cause they're advertised as wellness vapes that they're really um, also causing irritation in her lungs. So a little bit about why teens are vaping, we'll, we'll go into some of these uh, in more detail, but, you know, as I mentioned, the youth targeting market, the, they're marketing to our kids, right? You saw those pictures. Um, they are marketing to our kids and they're trying to get our kids. And the reason why is because they know, the industry knows uh, that 90% of addiction occurs before the age of 21. So if they can get our kids hooked before 21, uh, and it's sometimes even younger, um, they know they've got them for life, right? That's why, that's why the, the uh, tobacco industry was targeting my, my grandparents and my parents before us at a very young age. Um, if they can get them hooked on, on e-cigarettes before the age of 21, they've got them for life. And unfortunately, I can see it's very hard to quit once you start. Um, affordability, they're, they're, they're actually cheaper than cigarettes when you break it down, um, especially these disposable devices. They're really, um, really cheap. Um, the flavors are really the number one problem uh, in, in terms of hooking our kids. Um, most kids who start vaping start with a flavored product and 85% of high school users use flavors. They're just very enticing. Um, and, uh, and that's, what's really hooking our kids. 
And um, unfortunately, menthol is no exception to that. And so um, just to be aware, menthol has a, a secondary problem, uh, as does vaping in general, the, the chemicals in vapes, uh, the way it's been devised, um, and menthol, they both kind of numb the throat and the lungs, and they allow for a deeper inhale and a faster addiction. So um, menthol and any ice products are particularly bad um, in terms of uh, faster addiction. Um, sorry, did I miss any there? Um, just the flavored products. And, um, you know, social norms. I mean, I think that kids will say, oh, everybody's using these now, right? Um, what you can tell your children when they say that is, you know, I see it in parties, mom, everybody's using it. Um, you can say that it looks like everyone's using it and there really is an epidemic on our hands, but, but one in five, one in four kids, um, you know, it, it does mean that, that there are still three out of four not using. So you, you know, be strong and stand your ground. Um, you know, you can, you can kind of push through that, push through that peer pressure, but it's also that it's just become very normalized, right? Um, also, you know, uh, unfortunately we hear, you know, these products have been advertised as safer than cigarettes, right? But we know that um, when kids hear safer, they hear safe. And unfortunately, you know, being safer than a cigarette is not a very high bar, right? Cigarettes are really bad for, for kids and for anybody. But, um, but these products are not safe for kids. And I'll talk a little bit about the why, the chemicals and the nicotine and how it affects the brain. Um, but actually, um, you know, one really, really big issue, which Christina mentioned earlier, is that, um, you know, we hear from medical experts very often that there is a direct connection between substance use and mental health. And often kids will use drugs like nicotine to self-medicate um, if they have underlying anxiety or depression. Um, and unfortunately, this year and the last couple of years have been really um, off the charts for, kid, for youth anxiety and depression. And so what happens is they start using it to self-medicate, not realizing that actually the nicotine and the nicotine addiction specifically can really um, exacerbate underlying anxiety and depression. Um, Truth Initiative has a, a really fantastic um, uh, social media campaign now. Call, they call it the depression stick uh, because it really does, uh, can heighten you know, anxiety and depression. Um, also, these products cause this really incredible, like ten, within 10 seconds, this great nicotine kick for kids. And that is very alluring and very enticing. Um, and then another issue which has been a problem and was a question that came up as well is accessibility. You know, again, I sent my 15 year old when he was 15, I sent him into different stores to see if he could buy products. Um, nobody turned them down. I mean, they just want the money, right? And um, there, there are very few, I'm sure there are some vape, vape, uh, stores and other places that are indeed carding kids and can really um, exacerbate underlying anxiety and depression. Um, Truth Initiative has a, a really fantastic um, uh, social media campaign now. Call, they call it the depression stick uh, because it really does, uh, can heighten you know, anxiety and depression. Um, also, these products cause this really incredible, like ten, within 10 seconds, this great nicotine kick for kids. And that is very alluring and very enticing. Um, and then another issue, which has been a problem and was a question that came up as well, is accessibility. You know, again, I sent my 15 year old when he was 15, I sent him into different stores to see if he could buy products. Um, nobody turned them down. I mean, they just want the money, right? And um, there, there are very few, I'm sure there are some vape, vape, uh, stores and other places that are indeed carding kids and checking for age verification. But honestly, um, many are not. And so these products are really accessible to our kids. Um, friends are selling them to them, older brothers and sisters, um, and they're easy to buy in the mail, even though uh, thankfully some of the bigger um, the bigger companies like FedEx uh, and I believe even uh, USPS are saying you can no longer ship vapes in the mail, but they are being sent through the mail all the time. So it's really important that you check, you know, check your kids' um, spending habits if they have Venmo or something like that, some, some, or if you give an allowance, um, just to check and see what what they're doing with it, and maybe ask the question. Um, 
you know, I talk a little bit about this higher addictiveness. Uh, it's it's um, vaping, the, the nicotine in vapes is, was created by Juul. They're called nicotine salts and it hits the, the bloodstream very quickly. And, um, and it causes this again, very nice rush for the kids. Um, the other problem that makes it so addictive is that they can use it anywhere and they do. They use it in the bedrooms. Uh, people say that you know their kids hide them under their pillows because they can't get through the night without vaping or they wanna have it you know, first thing in the morning. Um, they use it in the classrooms. It's not like a cigarette where you have to go outside and it has a smell and you know when someone's using it. Um, it's very easy to conceal. Um, and also, again, what makes it so addictive is that um, one device has up to two packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine. So these are really packed. And, you know, if kids are at a party and they're sharing vapes, you can't really tell how much you're using because um, until it's gone, until it's empty. Whereas a pack of cigarettes, you know, someone might look at it and say, oh, I've used three or I've used five. I need to stop today. That's my that's my allotted amount or whatever. Um, you can't really tell with cigarette, with, uh, with vapes, unfortunately. Another problem with these products is that they're loaded with chemicals. Um, and these, many of these chemicals uh, are used in food additives, as food additives. And the FDA has approved them for food, but they have not been approved to combine with other chemicals, heat at high degrees and inhale into the lungs. That has not been proven safe. And in fact, in many cases, they are not. And the red ones here indicate um, that they're either toxic or carcinogenic or both. Um, but there are some that cause diseases like um, diacetyl, which, which causes something called popcorn lung, which is a scarring of the lungs. Um, but you know, kids, including my own said, don't worry, it's just flavored water. Well, there's 0% water in vapes. So that's really important for them to know. There is no water. This is all chemicals. And, um, and many of these chemicals are found in cigarettes as well. Um, and so, you know, not all of these chemicals are found in all devices, but um, the FDA has, you know, has qualified these or characterized these as many of these as harmful uh, substances. So, you know, it's, it could be years till we know the full effects of, um, of these products for our kids. And, um, you know, it, again, in terms of you know long-term lung lung health and um, you know uh, organ health, we don't necessarily know, but we know uh, from our public health experts and scientists that even um, that even just the aerosol uh, has been associated the the uh, e-cigarette aerosol has been associated with cancers of the lungs and the bladders of mice. So you know again, it could be years till we know the full health harms, but it's better to just avoid them. Um, also. I will just say, if you take away all these chemicals and just vape an empty device, um, these devices have these metal coils in them that get heated to high degrees. And as they get heated over and over, they start to disintegrate. And those little metal particulates get inhaled into the lungs. And unfortunately, that is not safe for anyone. Um, so, you know, as a, as a mom, I think for me, this is the most important thing is, okay, so it's harmful. How is it affecting my child? And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, children's brains, you know, they continue to grow till or develop until at least 21. Sometimes, you know, they say up to 25. Um, I'm still working on that uh, with my own. And um, developing brains are more sensitive to nicotine, um, which is why, you know, I mentioned 90% of those who struggle with addiction start before the age of 21. Um, kids brains are really open. They have their pathways are open for addiction and nicotine is a highly addictive substance. Oh, sorry, a highly addictive substance. And, um, and it can, it can hijack the reward system. So, you know, our brains make dopamine, which is this chemical that makes us feel good. Um, it's a pleasure transmitter in our brain and our brains make dopamine without any drugs. It makes it when we you know, when the kids score in soccer or win Xbox or something like that, they get a rush of dopamine. But what happens is when kids vape, um, their dopamine pathways get hijacked by the nicotine and then they need more and more nicotine just to feel normal. Um, and this becomes, you know, this start of the addiction, the withdrawal itself is such a terrible feeling that they need to continue vaping just to avoid the feeling of that, um, that withdrawal. 
So, and then we hear sometimes that kids dual use because they'll be so wired from the nicotine at night that they need THC to come down. So sometimes we get into dual use and it also just opens up the pathways for other, um, other addictions as well. And as Christina mentioned, uh, Truth Initiative came out with this really terrific study um, and, and termed what they call colliding crises, which is just, it's a perfect, sad, but perfect term for it, which is the dual crisis of the youth mental health issues and the nicotine use. So kids are using nicotine to medicate for stress, anxiety, depression, but unfortunately it's making it worse. Um, so, and then we have issues with the lungs. So as I mentioned, you know, it, it could be years till we really understand the full effects, but we know that, um, we know that, that these chemicals harm the developing lungs. Um, this is an aerosol. Uh, so, you know, I think if they called it aerosolizing and not vaping, probably kids would have been really turned off. But I think of hairspray, I think of those kind of things as aerosols, but aer these aerosols contain heavy metals, ultrafine metal particulates that get inhaled into the lungs. Also, these chemicals are reaching deep into the lungs um, and that it's causing inflammation. Um, it can exacerbate um, asthma. And, um, you know, we just don't know our kids' lungs are the healthiest they're going to be when they start vaping. And lungs develop even later than the brain, I've been told, and sometimes into the 30s. So we don't necessarily know until much later the full effects. But I do know that um, kids report, and including my own daughter, she was coughing a lot. Um, there was this dry cough. Uh, and then when she stopped vaping, she said that she had a much easier time breathing. We've heard this from kids time and again, um, athletes who have been, you know, who, who say that they can no longer really do what they used to do. They don't have the same capacity. Um, in addition, uh, there are issues with the heart. So nicotine is a stimulant. So it's going to stimulate the heart to, to race. Um, and uh, so kids have like racing hearts. Um, it's sort of establishes and, and releases a fight or flight response, right? Which is not good for kids um, unless they're in a really dangerous or exciting situation. Um, it can increase blood pressure and, um, and restrict blood flow. So um, it is not good for the heart cells. It's not good for, um, for the body. It also um, has weakens the immune system. So not just a risk for COVID, but um, weakening the immune system isn't great for anything, but it certainly raises the risk of COVID. Um, and unfortunately, you know, kids pass these things around. They don't just tend to keep them to themselves. So they're sharing germs, they're sharing vapes when they share germs. Um, and uh, so it not only makes you more susceptible to other, you know, viruses and things, but it also weakens the immune system. So when you do get sick, um, you're likely to get more sick. Um, also, you may have heard in the news, uh, with COVID, we haven't heard a lot in the news about, about this, but, um, but we, we did hear a lot of um, reports of seizures, kids reporting seizures um, through just too much nicotine in their bloodstream. And there's something called Nixic, which is a weight loss um, because uh, they lose, you know, kids lose their appetite um, and they have gastroenterological issues. Um, so that's something to be on the lookout for. And then, as I mentioned, this was also big in the news uh, before COVID, and now it's sort of all linked together. We don't necessarily know what's causing what, but Avali is this lung injury that's caused by vaping. Um, and if your kids say, you know, you've heard of these deaths caused by vaping, um, kids might tell you that there it really was only from vaping THC. But we know, in fact, that um, some of these deaths were reported um, were from kids who were only vaping nicotine. So that's really important for them to know. This is not, um, they're not out, uh, out of the woods if they're, if they're vaping. Um, and then just briefly, you know, I know we're sort of hopefully heading out of this pandemic, uh, but kids who vape are more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 and they're more likely to have uh, a more severe response to COVID. So that's just something to mention. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I know I, I showed that picture. Um, you may have this in your classroom. Sometimes different uh, counties put these classrooms up uh, for parents to, to see all these places where kids hide devices. But basically, these things are right in front of our eyes, right? We just don't know it. Um, these arrows point to, um, uh, you know, THC vapes uh, and vape pens and 
um, you know, they look like highlighters, right? They don't look like much, but it's just really important for us to know what they look like so we can have a conversation with our kids. So some of the signs of vaping. <laughs> um, this is tricky because our teens sometimes exhibit many of these signs and we just don't know if they're just being teenagers or if they have an issue. But I would say most importantly, what I found is changes in a child's behavior is, you know, could be more indicative than the actual behavior itself. But secretive attitude, um, really wanting to be not where you are, um, excuses to go to the restroom if you're out to dinner, um, just behavior that, show, you know, a little bit more secretive, um, the use of candles or opening windows all the time in the freezing cold winter, um, maybe a sign. Um, then there's this cough. I think I, I was mentioning, like I, I noticed this cough, it's a dry cough, um, just because the, the lungs are irritated. Um, sometimes a thirst uh, because these products, these chemicals make kids thirsty. Um, checking their spending and delivery habits. Uh, you know, now with COVID, a lot of, um, you know, uh, delivery people will not require signatures, right? They'll just drop at the door. And I can tell you, I mean, even Uber Eats is delivering vapes now. Um, our, my, a friend of mine's child had vapes delivered by Uber Eats and she had no idea until she did. And then, um, you know, so just be on the lookout for how your kids are spending money. And, um, and then changes in sleeping patterns, you know, because it's stimulant, it can really um, mess with kids' sleeping patterns. So they might have trouble falling asleep and um, just also a heightened sensitivity, a moodiness that you didn't necessarily no notice, maybe some violent anger um, or mood swings, irritability that just is out of the ordinary for your child. So, um, and again, just a change in eating, eating habits um, because the nicotine can make them not feel so well. So this is a part of the presentation that we always, I don't want to say struggle with, but it's very personal because, you know, um, every parent has their own style, has their own relationship with their child. But there are some things that we know, um, just again, based on public health, what our experts tell us. Well, we work with addiction psychiatrists um, who talk to us about, you know, the best things to do for our kids. One of them is modeling behavior. So if, if you smoke or vape, um, it's indicative of its pre predictor of kids' behavior. So if you, you know, again, no shame, no blame. I mean, our generation was targeted. This generation is now being targeted. So, you know, if you have to smoke or vape, maybe don't do it in front of the kids. Um, encouraging conversations with other trusted adults. So maybe it's not you. I know my kids tend not to talk to me, but maybe they'll talk to my, my, my brother, you know, their uncle or a pediatrician or a, another, you know, trusted friend. So it's just really important that, there, that there's a conversation here. Um, also, if you think your child has an issue to talk to the pediatrician, talk to local addiction specialists because um, they will probably have resources for you that, um, that you may not be aware of. Unfortunately, there are no, um, there are no uh, approved cessation devices for kids like patches and things like that. However, many doctors will, depending on your child's age, um, if they need it, they will help uh, prescribe something for your child um, so that you should definitely have a conversation. Um, and, um, and then really just being an advocate for your child. You know, uh, there are some schools that are still punishing for uh, finding vapes at school. And we're really trying to work with schools to think about it in a different way. If your child has an addiction, um, it's very hard to quit. It's punishment will not help. Um, and starting young, starting as early as nine. I mean, I know with smoking, I started with my kids at like three um, to the point where they thought cigarettes were the devil. But um, at nine, kids are already starting to see, uh, they're starting to see it in the bathrooms, in the classrooms. They're starting to see it with their older brothers and sisters. So it's out there. So it's just important to, for them to be aware that you're aware and have start a conversation with them. Um, and then, you know, there's no one time, right? Have a, this is a, a sort of going back to the conversation time. And again, when you're in the car using different examples, if you see things on TV, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, TV shows have, have kids vaping and adults vaping. So it's a good time to have a conversation with them. And then just coming from a place of support, because again, especially if they, if you think they have uh, a, a dependency issue, 
Um, these kids were targeted. They were targeted to believe that these products were harmless and, um, and, uh, and to think that these products are normal and they're not harmless. And so we really wanna help kids understand um, that you know, we can, we're concerned about them um, we are doing our own homework, right? It's what you're doing now. So um, just to have a conversation with them. Um, I, that's all, you know, that's basically the same. Um, it's really very personal. Not everybody has a different approach, right? And not to exaggerate. I mean, unfortunately, the facts are scary enough. We have um, advocates whose, whose children have died um, from vaping. I mean, likely, you know, our kids are not going to die from vaping, you know, but if they have asthma, they're at really they're at high risk. Um, but even if they don't die, there's still you know there are health harms associated with vaping, harms to the brain, to the lungs, to the body, to the organs. Um, and you know one way to get to our kids um, is uh, is perhaps not talking about the health harms, but we have something uh, we have a, a campaign that we're running right now called Vapes Are Trash, which is talking about the environmental harms of vaping and. Um, because it is huge. Um, there's a, this, it's, I think it's the next uh, environmental crisis, unfortunately, because these contain lithium batteries. Um, they're being dumped in, in garbages and facilities that, that they can't handle it. And so very often, because kids, our kids now are all such advocates for the environment, that may be a way to get to kids is talking about the, the environmental harms. Um, if you suspect your child has, uh, has an addiction. Um, we, I'm going to turn it over in one minute, um, but I just wanted to, to Nori, but I just wanted to first mention that there are a couple of really great resources that are more nationally based. Um, and then Nori will talk about some of the local um, resources that you have. Truth Initiative has a great app that hundreds of thousands of kids are using called This Is Quitting. And you can use it as a parent. I've tried it. Um, kids can use it as well. It just pro it, it provides support while they're trying to quit. And it's sort of, it's AI driven. It's artificial intelligence driven, but it does provide some support for kids. Um, Smokefree.gov also has some resources. Um, and then in the classroom, there are two programs. Uh, I'm sure there are many others, but these are two that we really love. Um, because uh, they're really um, very easy to use. Anyone can use them. You don't have to be a health teacher. You could be um, you know, a PE teacher or an English teacher. Um, and one is the Stanford Medicine Tobacco Prevention Toolkit. And the other is through catch.org called Catch My Breath. And they're both uh, vaping programs. They're multi-day programs that um, you do in the classroom with kids. And again, provides everything, resources, the flyers, talking points, everything you need. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Nori. And while I do, if you all don't mind, um, we'd love your feedback on, um, on this. And also, if you want to volunteer in your own community, we are always looking for people to basically do what I'm doing, which is just giving education to the community. So to schools, um, other parents in your community. Um, if you just, everyone knows how to use QR codes now uh, since COVID, but if you can just um, go on that uh, and just fill out a very brief survey, we'd love your feedback on anything that you think we haven't gotten to. So Nori, if you wanna take it from here and then we'll try and answer some questions after. Great, thank you, Mimi. Thanks for all the great information <laughs> getting folks on uh, board <laughs> and up to date. Uh, there, as you can see, is a lot going on around vaping and yeah. um, the use of these products. I, I have, who is now an 18-year-old, but two years ago, he, um, he has, he's got a bunch of friends that were vaping pretty profusely, but they would never vape around him because he knew, they knew what I do for a living. <laughs> and so... Um, they would always avoid, you know, doing that stuff around him. But, you know, as soon as he would show up, they would hide their devices. So um, sometimes it's, it's acceptable in these, in these um, peer circles. Sometimes it's not so much. But it's hard to be a youth these days. It's hard to be a parent. Um, so really important. I echo what you're saying about, you know, what Mimi was saying about um, talking with them, not at them, and opening these conversations up because it is very important. Um, as far as what's available for resources in, and I'm specifically talking about the King County area, um, 
we have um, our website is what I will direct folks to first. And um, our website has a bunch of different, different information, a variety of um, audiences. We've got infographics that folks can print out and share. We have um, links to other online resources. Um, there's everything from you know vape to hookah to <laughs> tobacco use and some data sprinkled in between. Um, the curricula that Mimi mentioned is also in in our on our website. Um, the Quit Line is also a good resource to use. They have a program for youth for 13 to 17 year olds. So I would recommend that folks um, check that link out. And if you're curious about it, I would call the Quit Line. Um, the Quit Line is actually operated out of our state. I'm not sure if many folks know that, but um, their offices are in downtown Seattle. And the Quit Line, they as far as I know, they won't send any information or any mail to the youth, but youth can call the quit line as many times as they want. I'm sure they'll refer them to resources, tech support that Mimi mentioned, um, and also some online um, self, self-help self uh, resources are available. Uh, the health point clinics in this area are also a good resource, um, CMAR community clinics. Um, one thing about the health point clinics is that they have behavioral health providers um, or consultants on their staff. So um, if folks are dealing with whatever kind of behavioral mental health issue, um, they're able to address that. And, you know, as a program, I work for Public Health Seattle and King County in the, to in the commercial tobacco and vapor prevention program. And <laughs> trainings are, you know, limited as far as as many as we were we were um, we are able to do many of the trainings have gone online as you know but we are still trying to get trainings out there to um, educate providers and make them aware of what what this scene looks like um, now and how to have those conversations and um, to use the best practices that are out there to help with the nicotine dependence and addiction um, also wanted to point out that you know, we, as a program, are working on some, I think we're going to try to make it every few months, so like a quarterly thing. We just had one for the um, an event for the Auburn and South King County community where we had youth actually speaking up on youth, on, on youth use and how they started and what would be beneficial for them. Um, and we had a behavioral health partner on the call and uh, someone from the American Academy of Pediatrics. But it's a it's a community dialogue and once that gets kicked off again, we'd love for parents to join in on that. Um, other resources. We many of us got pulled away from the, our program due to um, community mitigation around COVID. Um, but the program that I got pulled onto is with the emotional emotional health and well-being of the community, particularly BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. And so um, what I've been really honing in on is integrating um, vaping, education, and tobacco use into meetings and into conversations so that, um, you know, there's just so much overlap and intersection. And um, how do we talk more about dealing with the anxiety and depression and all of these stresses and stressors that are going on in a more healthy way. So really bringing up the fact that um, meditations and deep breathing techniques and other coping strategies, exercise um, and things like that really do um, help with, you know, lessening that, those um, feelings of anxiety and stress. Um, I think there's going to be an opportunity to share resources, so I will send pay folks links to those. I want to leave some time for questions, so thank you for your attention and thank you for being here. Hi, thanks, Nori. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in uh, during registration. Um, one is about dangerous to pregnant moms, and so I actually, I just assume that it is, in fact, dangerous, but I did ask Christina, who was a resident expert on all things um, nicotine related. And she 
does in fact say that nicotine does cross the placentas. It is not safe for um, developing bodies, little bodies. So um, also the heavy metals in these, as I mentioned, these metal particulates that get inhaled are not good for, for kids, for fetuses and, and moms alike probably. But um, the other question is how to make sure my teen quits vaping. And this one's really tricky because, I mean, if you really, really want to make sure, but unfortunately it creates an adversarial relationship, but there are nicotine tests. They're very cheap. You can buy them on Amazon and buy them online. Um, and they're easy to use in, in home. They're urine tests. Um, it could be a little tricky for your relationship. You know, that's the only question, right? Um, unfortunately, uh, many of us don't really know if our kids are still vaping, uh, except by having conversations with them and hoping that they're being honest. But, um, you know, when they're really ready to quit, uh, they'll, they will try what they need to do to quit. You know, my daughter was talking about hypnosis. I said, I'll try anything, whatever you want, we'll try it. Um, there are, you know, there are what I would say sort of untested, unscientifically proven, um, you know, methods of, of quitting. Um, along with these quitting, quitting resources. And we're trying to put more of them up on our resource page, even though we, we can't endorse them because you know, they, they don't have, um, there's, there's no scientific research done with them, right? Uh, across um, a wide population. But, um, but unfortunately, you know, other than nicotine testing, I think it's gonna be hard to know other than self-reporting, right? Um, but the, the truth is that when our kids really wanna quit that we can help them that there is help and it's really just a question of supporting them and trying to um, provide you know, resources for them. And again, some of it is, um, could be cognitive behavioral therapy, which is more, um, it's more talk therapy around specific behaviors, or it could be medical you know, devices like the patches and gums and things like that. But the important thing is not to try to self um, treat because um, these things need to be, you know, should be talked to talk through with a doctor. I mean, talk to the pediatrician. Um, and if the pediatrician doesn't have answers, because unfortunately, this is really still a new topic and not all pediatricians um, fully understand the situation. Um, but you can find answers with, um, you know, other doctors, adult doctors as well. But pediatricians should be a great starting place. Um, what kind of approach? To, oh, yeah. sorry. I mean, uh, we had a Q&A question come in about um, Spanish language resources. So I just wanted to point people to our website. I can drop a link in the chat, but we do have a page of resources, um, handouts in Spanish. We do this presentation in Spanish with um, Spanish-speaking volunteers. Um, so if you actually have, you know, a parent community, we besides doing these at city or state levels and national events, um, we collaboratively host events with PTAs, with um, you know local level prevention groups. Um, so if you uh, have a Spanish speaking community that you think would benefit from this, please reach out to Pave or even email me directly um, or using the link. So, yeah, there are um, yeah. some great Spanish resources available. Thank you for that. That's really important. And someone did ask about um, the slide with the images on it, all the vaping devices, because they wanted to have that. Is that still on our resource page? Because I know we used to have that on there. I can actually email. We have like a a handout that sort of serves as the show and tell that's just about identifying devices. It's not Great. a slide, it's a handout. I can definitely show that. Great. Um, and then again, uh, you know, Christina's sort of spearheading this wonderful um, vapes or trash campaign, which um, I think is a fantastic way to get kids invested because um, it really is a terrible. Um, environmental hazard. And um, it is a terrific way to get kids to become advocates for this, as opposed to, you know, the finger wagging sort of, you know, oh, you shouldn't be vaping, but to, to have a conversation with their own peers about the dangers uh, to the environment of vaping. But uh, if there are no other questions, I think I may have answered most of these. Um, um, what kind of approach to vaping education do you find most youth are most responsive to? You know, the two that I mentioned, Catch My Breath, um, is, a, is a really good one. And the Stanford Tobacco Toolkit is also fantastic. Um, those are in the classroom. And then the environmental, the vapes are trash, uh, I think could be really great. Um, I think that was all. Where do they buy these products? I mean, you know, bodegas. 7-Elevens, all these, you know, all these stores are carrying vape shops in New York. We have a lot of vape shops. Um, so they're all selling to kids. Unfortunately, I'm sure there are some that aren't, I'm not going to say um, all of them, but many sell to kids. Um, they're really accessible 
through friends and um, other peers. So very easy to get their hands on. So it's really, I think the education is probably most helpful in, in prevention. I also hear a lot about kids buying them over social media, kids reselling them over Snapchat and TikTok, um, where there isn't a lot of yeah. age restriction of what kids are viewing. I'm gonna drop a link, I don't think we've showed it yet, um, from King County about uh, reporting violations. So if you know of a store that is selling these products to kids that are under age, under 21, um, you can report them to the county to have them follow up. Yeah. I don't know offhand with the, you know, fines or what the, what happens, but, um, you know, it always helps to, to know where this is happening. Yeah, it's great that uh, that was another question that came in. I'm sorry, I didn't answer that. But that is a great question. I mean, in terms of one question was, how do we educate retailers? Well, retailers know, they know that they shouldn't be selling to kids under 21. Um, and if they don't, <laughs> this might remind them. So you can actually report uh, stores who are selling to kids. So if you send your child in <laughs> as a test pilot, I don't recommend that. Um, but um, but it's fantastic that your community has a resource for reporting um, because uh, not all do. And we're actually trying to establish these as sort of watchdog local community, local community watchdogs for reporting uh, retailers because it shouldn't be. And, and most laws um, do protect the, the buyer, uh, the kid, but um, they, they should not be protecting the retailer. So um, I think that was all the questions that I, I think I got to most of them, the most popular products we talked about. So yeah, if there's nothing else, I think that's it, but you can always reach us. Um, we're available, Christina and Charlie and myself uh, available at our name at parentsagainstvaping.org. Um, you can also um, send us uh, any questions you have. And if you wanna volunteer and do what we're doing, we really need people across the country to do this in your own communities. Um, advocating and educating in your communities um, so that we can tell more people. I think people just need to know. Once they know, I think it will really go a long way in preventing this epidemic. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thanks, Nori. And thanks to Public Health Green County. Seattle. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Really appreciate it. I'm going to stop sharing. Bye. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs>